Hello, listeners. If you haven't liked, subscribed, or followed the Sounds of Living podcast accounts, you could find us on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Patreon at Sounds of Living Podcast. Any donation would be greatly appreciated to help support my journey of taking Sounds of Living around the United States. Thank you. Welcome back to Sounds of Living. I'm your host today, Alex Kellerman, and I'm sitting here with one of my closest friends, Colin Brawl. How are you doing, man? I'm good. How are you doing, man? I'm good. Yeah. Why don't you tell everybody about yourself, Colin? Uh, I've known Alex since, what, seventh grade? So, yeah. Or wait, I think it was seventh, eighth grade. Seventh eighth or eighth grade when you moved. Yeah. yeah. It was eighth grade, and it was banned. So, I mean, if there's not a coincidence there already, I mean. Oh, yeah. Yeah, music's always been one of my biggest passions up there with animals and I don't know, maybe snowboarding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like a few big passions and that's kind of it. But music has always driven who I am. So what do you do? For work, I do laser engraving for a gun manufacturer. That's fun. A lot of government rules that I got to abide by there. But pays the bills. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's definitely not going to be a long-term situation, but that's what I got right now. I used to do laser cutting where it was more industrial, cutting big old sheets of metal with actually one of my buddies that you're going to be podcasting with, Nate. Yeah, he uh, has worked with me at a couple of these jobs doing welding or brake press or whatever else. What got you into it? Uh, I had a friend. We're not friends anymore. That's a long story. But I did have a really close friend whose dad worked in one of these warehouses and he got us an in. And at that point, I kind of just stuck with it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's been consistently keeping you afloat financially. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's blue collar work, it's nothing crazy, but it's got a lot of potential to move into more of a white collar scenario, uh, more like sales engineer type stuff, because I'm familiar with the machines that I run. It's got potential, but as of right now, it's more of a stepping stone. Yeah, we're all in this process trying to figure out what we are meant to do, and it's good to have financial stability while mm-hmm. figuring that out and getting to where we want to be. Mm-hmm. So that's, yeah. that's dope that you found something that you're able to support yourself with. Thanks, man. For your music that you listen to, can you just tell me more about how music has impacted you in general? What exactly started this love for music? Definitely my parents. Yeah. Yeah. Both my mom and my dad. Yeah. They were always big on music. And it wasn't just them. I mean, my whole family has been, you know, in and out of bands, whether it was brass or strings, whatever it was. My dad started with trumpet and then moved to bass. He joined a Rage Against the Machine-esque punk rock band back in the 80s or 90s. He and my mom got together, I believe, while he was in that band, and she was a metalhead. Hmm. Yeah, so it totally worked out. My parents would always be showing me new music. My sister, too, honestly. She's introduced me to a lot of the heavier stuff that I've got into, like junior high-ish. In what genre is that? My sister got me into heavy metal, like the modern stuff. Okay. Um, Nothing too heavy, heavy, but heavy for the average user, if that makes sense. For sure, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, not the farthest end of the scale, but kind of set me on the path to becoming a true full-blown metalhead like I am now. And then was your dad a metalhead as well? Yes. Okay. Um, He's the one that got me into Deftones and System of a Down, Tool. Tool was a big one. But he also had, you know, I wouldn't say a softer side, but, you know, more of an appreciation for the classic stuff like Red Hot Chili Peppers, Pink Floyd. He loves his classic metal, like the Iron Maiden and Led Zeppelins of the world. So he's got a very wide variety when it comes to that stuff. It just doesn't ever breach into the modern heavy, if that makes sense. So then what type of music does he play? Right now, he's on and off playing with his uh, old band, actually. At least some of the members of the old band. One Is of it which. Metal? It's not metal. They could do metal if they wanted to. They're good enough to by any means. But they uh, actually played at churches for a while just because lead singer and guitarist is actually my godfather. And he's heavily religious. And once they stopped pursuing, you know, that rock dream, they were just playing for what they liked at that point. And he was heavily Christian. Or at least I'm not exactly sure which religion. But he, yeah. yeah, exactly. But he was religious. My dad, not so much, but he'd play with them anyways because he loves the band. 
That's cool. Yeah. So tell me more about Deftones. Yeah, Deftones was one of the early ones that my dad introduced into my life to the point where, you know, I can remember songs being played, you know, when I was like five kind of thing. Oh, that Just early. Like, like in the car, yeah. First one that I remember him playing specifically, the song that got me into them was Digital Bath. It's a pretty popular one. Um, I'm sure most people have heard it at some point. It is a radio hit. Maybe not by name, but by sound. A lot of people would recognize it for sure. They've just got such a different spacey, ambient, literally floating through space kind of vibe. And you can feel every single emotion that comes out into his words. Like you can feel exactly how he feels when he sings. And it's, uh, it hit me when I was young. That one stuck with me pretty heavily. So how often do you listen to Deftones now? Regularly. They're a big staple in my playlist. I'm always queuing their stuff up. I fucking adore Deftones. <laughs> so would you say that you have a favorite album by them? That's tricky. Or maybe like a top two. Yeah, the White Pony album is the one that got me into them, but I wouldn't necessarily say my favorite. I would have to say the album with Kim Dracula and Xerxes in combat, that album was a top tier album, in my opinion. I can't think of the name right off the top of my head. I got the image of it engraved in my brain, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But that's the album that I think I continuously go back to. I know that you had said that when you listen to their vocals, like you can tell that they're into the music and they're very passionate. They spoke to you could you just tell that they're being vulnerable was that what was attracting you to that music did you feel like everything they were saying was accurate to what you were feeling what exactly about deft tones and maybe just like heavy metal in general so people could understand it better because like i'm not somebody who listens to <laughs> heavy metal but yeah i want to see what realm that mm -hmm. maybe i could get introduced to and especially for like other listeners too because i feel like a lot of the times when there's genres out there that were not as familiar with or we do know there's stereotypes that are associated with it and like mm -hmm. certain opinions that are I guess widely told and they just assume that's what it's about yeah but like I want to understand so there aren't any misconceptions about the genre can you tell us more about it yeah so biggest misconception about you know metal especially when you get into the really heavy stuff is that it's all just satanic propaganda anger that you know leads to violence and a lot of it is don't get me wrong, but a lot of it isn't. A lot of it is anger derived from being hurt or, you know, growing up with a horrible family life, depressed, anger issues is a big one. A lot of metalheads have anger issues. <laughs> And the metal is like all those loud power chords, the fast guitar strumming, the whammy bar shit, the screaming into the mic. It's how they let their anger out in a way that doesn't hurt other people. In fact, it helps other people get their anger out. That way, it's in the music, it's not in their life. A lot of metalheads, especially if you look at interviews like, example, Slipknot, they are a bunch of dorks. They are just a bunch of bros looking to party and have fun and make people's lives better. They truly care about their audience and they truly understand they wouldn't be where they were if it wasn't for their fans. A lot of these guys don't take what they have for granted. Some do, don't get me wrong. There are some red flags in the metal world and a lot of us metalheads know exactly who they are. Some of us don't care, but I don't know. It's not all just angry to be angry. It's angry for a reason. For someone like me, you know, who can't play that music on a regular basis or just doesn't have the time or, you know, I don't have a band. I love playing guitar, but, you know, time and being an adult, it's tricky, you know? So, yeah. like, listening to that shit while I'm working kind of secondhand gets it out of my system, if that makes sense. Are you an angry person? No. Usually I'm not. I uh, used to be. <laughs> when I was growing up teenage years, I definitely had some pretty gnarly anger issues. And if you knew me back then, I think you know exactly what I'm talking about. But I was never somebody that would fight somebody, if that makes sense. I was the per kind of person to take it out of myself. And that's another common trend in metalheads is self-deprecation. Because a lot of us hate ourselves or are actively working on not, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I don't know. A lot of us are <laughs> a little mental. That's the fun thing about metalheads is that we're a little off the rock. But when it comes to what we care about, we're passionate and we will fight for it. And a lot of that includes the people around us. A lot of that aggression is towards ourselves and to the people that held them back, if that makes sense. The people that would push them down. Because a lot of us, none of us were popular kids, that's for damn sure. You feel like you're not the only one that feels angry sometimes. And a lot of these guys, like I said, in person, nothing but dweebs. 
Like, they'll make dick jokes. Like, a lot of these dudes will literally take kids up on stage. Literal 10-year-olds that love these guys for whatever reason. You know, 10-year-old loving Slipknot is wild. Weren't you one? I was one. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Bringing up a 10-year-old that idolizes these guys, they don't give a shit. They'll bring them up on stage. They didn't have to pay any extra. They didn't ask for that. They'll just bring them up. You know, let them have a little bit of an extra experience. And they do it regularly. Do they have them play with them, or do they just have them watch? There are a lot of artists that will actually have certain people come in and play. Like, I've seen Foo Fighters actually did this, I believe. They had someone's son step in for Taylor Hawkins once he passed a year or two ago. It might have even been Taylor's son. I don't remember, but somebody's son stepped in and played for quite a while, and he was a phenomenal player, but he's like 16 or something wild like that. I had seen Foo Fighters, like, one of the last concerts right before Taylor died. Yeah, dude. And... It's just, it's so sad when somebody who has helped influence the world in a positive manner, put a lot of passion into his work, passes away. But you see that a lot of these artists are just trying to help people and make people's lives better. And it's cool that you've seen these videos of a drummer taking on that role. Yeah. And in that same concert or that weekend when I did see a bunch of people perform, I saw Green Day and the Black Crows and Weezer. And when I saw Green Day, there's a TikTok that actually was posted not too long after the concert. And this was just this past February. There was a guy that was called up on the stage or it might have been a girl i'm not sure guy okay. or girl but they were called up on the stage and they're like can anybody play guitar hmm, nice and, and then someone like raised their hand and they brought them up and as they brought them up they like shredded and knew the song mm-hmm. instantaneously and i don't even remember the name of the song like i like green day but i don't know their stuff i like, get I that do. yeah i mean again one of the coolest performances ever i mean they're a huge staple in grunge and just mm-hmm. like that early 2000s late 90s they understood and like controlled the music industry Mm -hmm. i mean same time as who doesn't know green day yeah who doesn't i mean that's a name that everyone knows whether you listen to them or not going back to getting people involved and like feeling included and being able to be your full authentic self when listening to the music you love like it's cool that these artists are allowing people to do that with them yeah. and be a part of the music like they share the experience with the people that idolize these guys you know yeah. whether you like green day or not if you're given the opportunity to play with those guys you're gonna take it yeah. i mean they're great dudes all in all too like not just the music itself like they're cool guys i'm not into green day and i'd play with them you know oh, what yeah. i mean like yeah. i mean it's an opportunity of a lifetime like who wouldn't want to play with a famous musician yeah. or band and that's my favorite thing about not just heavy metal but rock in general the classic yeah. rock the heavy rock the old rock all of it like it all comes from a place of i'm gonna be myself and if you have an issue with that that's on you don't come at me for it you know what i mean and that's across the entire board and it's all about i don't know accepting one another you know like one of my favorite things about corn like when they what something that they say all the time is i'm still a freak you know what i mean like love me or hate me i'm always gonna be a freak and i embrace the freak because if i don't then i'm not myself i personally sure as shit don't want to be normal I don't want to be no cookie cutter. I mean, I got dreads down to my ass. You know, I'm working on full tats, you know. Like, I don't want to look or be like anybody else. I want to be myself. And a lot of these guys push that message hard. Be yourself. Be a freak. Why not? Life is short. Life is harsh. Enjoy what you got. You know what I mean? Very true. Yeah. I'm glad that you have that influence in your life. And speaking of Slipknot earlier, why don't (laughs) you tell me more about how you got into them? Yeah, that was my sister. That was all my sister at this point because I was going through some pretty heavy personal stuff at the time. And my sister, same with my parents, big on music. And she was starting to go into the heavier realm than my parents were, hence the Slipknot. And my dad is just now getting into Slipknot because of me. This is like 10 years ago at this point, maybe 12 even, something like that. But my sister showed me a song. It was from the Grey album, uh, The Devil and I. I'm sure everyone's heard it at some point. It's uh, another radio hit. 98 KUPD plays it all the time up in Phoenix. But she showed me that one, and I fell in love with the guitar. I fell in love with the yelling. I fell in love with his singing, because Corey Taylor, the singer, has a phenomenal singing voice. Like, when it comes to the heavy metal realm, no, they're not the heaviest, but he knows how to balance his singing with his screaming to a point where 
it can go kind of either way with them. He's got multiple bands, even. Uh, some that are... The second band that he's in, Stone Sour, it's a little bit lighter, but they're still heavy. He doesn't do as much of the screaming, not as much of the fast drums, fast guitar, whatever. It's more like a classic heavy, if that makes sense. But my sister showed me Slipknot, and I realized what I was missing out on. And that's the band that pretty much introduced me to the corn of the world. Even like Avenged Sevenfold. I was, I was getting into Avenged Sevenfold before Slipknot, but that's the realm. Like, tw I think I was like probably 11 or 12 when I fell in love with fast guitar and yelling. <laughs> I didn't really care at that point. Honestly, at the time, I didn't even really think about how it helped or anything like that. I can see how it helped now because it was, like I said, kind of secondhand letting me take my anger out. At the time, it was just shit that I liked to listen to. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't think about why at the time. You were just drawn to it and you did it. Exactly. Yeah. And my sister had some pretty heavy playlists that she introduced to me. A couple other bands on there, like Of Mice and Men. Um, not as heavy, but Breaking Benjamin, like that kind of stuff. She opened the door to that stuff, which I ended up exploring for the next until now honestly i'm still looking into all of it because as heavy as i like it now i still appreciate and love the stuff that's not as heavy you know it's all about rock for me you're able to be a part of each subcategory within this big umbrella that's rock yeah and, and there's heavy metal exactly and i gravitate towards one end but i love the entire thing if that makes sense for sure. Yeah, I mean, like, Pink Floyd. <laughs> they are the epitome of not heavy. I love Pink Floyd. That's another one my dad was big on. And actually, another one of our buddies, Cameron, he's the one that actually really pushed Pink Floyd on me. You remember how, still to this day, how much he loves Pink Floyd. He uh, pushed that one on me. And I was pretty hesitant at first. I don't know why. They were a little too slow for me. But eventually... I gave him the benefit of the doubt, probably junior high, like late junior high, and I ate my words. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're phenomenal, and they're, you know, big name for a reason. For sure shit ain't heavy, though. Yeah. Yeah. Pink Floyd's pretty incredible. Oh, yeah. I remember for me and Cameron, I think he was dating somebody at the time, and one of his girlfriends had given him a Dark Side of the Moon vinyl, and he got the posters out of it, and he's like, well, you have a record player, so yeah. you should take the vinyl, and I remember listening to it, you know back and front and i mean i also had talked about pink floyd with jake too because mm -hmm. he, he really likes the wall and i don't know it's i think even we sat in your room one time listening to the wall oh yeah. yeah yeah it's so cool that it has this huge impact on everybody i love the music as much as everybody else i think when you start Dark Side of the Moon, every single song flows from one song to the next. And that was like one of the first albums I've ever heard that's done that. Yeah, it's not common anymore. No. It's, it wasn't common back then by any means either. No. That transition from song to song was lost somewhere. In and they do that in everything now. I mean, like, yeah. or they, I guess they did it in the rest of their albums from at least their popular stuff. Yeah. Like from like Animals to yeah, Dark Side yeah. of the Moon to Wish You Were Here to The Wall. And I mean, I don't know a lot of the other albums that they have done but i'm horrible at name dropping for oh Pink yeah floyd absolutely i know some of the song names but not album names as much cameron knows it like a dictionary i swear to god oh yeah i yeah. mean when you're attracted to an artist you just know everything That's i can I feel name... about slipknot <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely uh, that's incredible i'm glad that you have this good relationship with music i mean shit dude i got slipknot tattooed to my thigh <laughs> you know what i mean that's what this is right here so this is a nonogram it's a nine point star and each one represents one of the members of the band it's nothing satanic about it can you explain the tattoo like the whole yeah. picture of it to the audience because they can't see it yeah so it's got a mirrored goat head basically connected to one body goat head on bottom goat head on top and behind it is the nonogram and if you're familiar familiar with Slipknot, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If not, I mean, you can look it up. It's pretty self-explanatory. It does look very satanic. Absolutely. I understand that. That's kind of the point, but it's, so it's not. Like a, it's got like a goat on it too? Yeah, they uh, reference goats a lot in their music just because of the connection. Or they don't reference goats a lot. It's just kind of a common theme. So like, what's the connection? Uh, with the goat? Uh-huh. Sacrifice, because that's a big one in satanic culture and not in any sort of satanic way. It's just a symbol a of symbol sacrifice. Okay. Yeah because yeah. goats have always been, for some reason, the animal that gets their throat slit 
to the gods of whoever. Who knows? I mean, it's a big ritualistic thing, but yeah. in music, at least with Slipknot, it's a symbol for sacrifice. That's how I take it anyways. I don't know if there's any legitimate writing yeah. on that. I mean, I've looked into it. I've looked into the goat. They, they give him a name, actually. I forget what the goat name is, but their goat has a name. It's all fun and games with them, though. They lean so heavy into the satanic shit because it bothers people. So it's just more, I think when people look at metal stuff, it's to get people to try to understand it and like look at them and see what they're doing and mm-hmm. then whether they decide to listen to it and try to understand it that's up to them exactly so then you look into the lyrics on some of these songs and you're like oh this man's heartbroken <laughs> i get where the anger is coming from because if you read between the lines or even directly what the lines say it says exactly what you know they're heard about you just gotta pay attention and not like turn off because oh they're angry they're yelling i don't want to listen to this yeah. if you took the time to dive into it some of this shit is poetry like it's weird some of these guys Guys can write the way that they do. So then how does that lead you into Lorna Shore? Yeah, that was more recent. That was about a year ago at this point. I just got out of a bad relationship and I had a friend of my sister's introduce me to death metal and deathcore, which is pretty much the far end of the scale when it comes to heavy music. There's really not much heavier. There are bands that are heavier than others, but when it comes to that genre, it's about as heavy as it gets because of the anger and heartbreak at the time. I needed something (laughs) a little bit more than Slipknot because I was desensitized a little bit to that stuff listening to it for the last 10 years. Every once in a while, you listen to a song too much and it kind of loses feeling, so you got to put it in a corner for a little bit and then come back to it, you know? I feel like that's why a lot of people, you know, including myself, will go from genre to genre to genre to genre and, like, from artist to artist because you don't want to lose those feelings that you have associated with it Mm -hmm. or even the new ones that come about. Yeah. It's... I mean, don't mean to get like too philosophical, but by all means, (laughs) but I feel like we need to continue to expose ourselves to different genres because if we're not like continuing to learn, then our brains get bored and they get, and they become content with not changing. And that is an issue. You lose the feeling. Yeah. You don't get to have the love. It becomes numb. Yeah. You know what I mean? You don't want to be numb. Yeah. Unless it's in the best way. Dude, the you know feeling, what I mean? Like, the, the, yeah, the, the numbness is, like, more of just, like, trying to get away from what you don't like going on in your life. And you are feeling the music. That numb's okay. Not the numb yeah. of, like, listening to something to the point where it doesn't even affect you anymore. A You're song just, like, that used to make to you cry that now just blank face yeah. the entire time. You gotta put it away for a minute. The feeling of finding a song, a new song that you've never heard before, that is exactly what you're looking for. There's not a feeling in the world like that to me. Finding a new genre or a new band or like you know some weird niche song that has been out for 30 years that you'd never heard of and it's like where has this been my whole life you know this is gonna define the next two months of my life (laughs) you know what I mean at least you know I'm gonna live by this because I feel it don't you think that music comes when it's supposed to yeah absolutely there's something to do with right place right time for that kind of stuff if you're not ready for something or if you're not into it it's not gonna come a lot of the times this shit will come out of nowhere I never thought I'd be into death metal like I've given it a shot before but i didn't have the feeling associated with it if that makes sense so you're saying that by having more experiences it will lead you to different music because you want to be able to find something that relates to that experience bingo exactly that music is your life and you know if you didn't grow up angry there's you know yeah you're not going to be listening to the angry music it makes sense it just does because you don't have that feeling in your life why introduce it you know what i mean if you're not sad your whole life why are you going to be listening to goth music it's just it's what defines you and it comes out a lot more than people think especially the people that like music but don't really listen to it too much people that aren't as passionate about it you can still read or at least tell a lot about a person by what they'll put on in the car and a lot of those people music doesn't connect with them so they'll do podcasts hence this or movies books you know what i mean a lot of people music isn't it and i don't understand that personally but a lot of people don't care for music do you think that it's because they haven't found what they connect with or they've connected with something else i mean a lot of bookworms or why listen to music if you can read words that pertain to you in a different kind of way Um, you're able to like listen to your own voice rather than anyone else's yeah or 
like painters, you know what I mean? They get it out in their own way. It's a big thing about the arts in general is whether you gravitate towards one or the other, we all have one that we gravitate towards and that's our outlet and music is mine. Uh, we were in marching band, you know what I mean? Jazz band, like all this stuff. We've both played guitar our entire lives. We've had most of our friends growing up, at least personally, were into music in some way or another. Absolutely. I mean, we both had a really close friend of ours pass away, and he was a phenomenal drummer. You know what I mean? He's like, a phenomenal musician. In general, he could play like the he... drums, guitar. He'd pick up a trumpet and you know make a noise out of it, never playing before. He, he... was something, dude. Do you mind if I say his name? Absolutely. Okay. Say it. So we're talking about Braxton Goldstein, and he's been a part of my life longer than I've even known Colin. You've known him for a long time. It was was funny because when Colin and I met it wasn't until like after some time had passed and we all had like come together into the same school after I had like moved come back yeah so you didn't introduce me to him he didn't introduce me to you we no, all just, just became like, friends yeah, yeah it was so cool but for me just to kind of give you a short summary of how we met and like how we became like this kind of group of friends that would hang out every so often mm -hmm. him and I did uh, gymnastics together yeah we did that for like eight years throughout our childhood and he's a funny kid man like uh, nothing we, but goof and we didn't really get into a whole lot of stuff outside of gymnastics when we were kids but it wasn't until I had moved back to Arizona we had met yeah. and then I re-met Braxton again and then we all was that up, at Perry well no we I met him in because I had gone back to the gym that's what it was and right. he was still going there and I had quit but like I was just trying to see if I wanted to continue with it because I was doing like, parkour and because mm -hmm. like I didn't want to go full on competing with gymnastics. But anyways, we, we had hung out. We ended up going to the same school and that was Perry. Yeah. Yeah. Us three, we all went to Perry. Then as he started like finding his group of people in high school because it's kind of changed through time because he was one of those guys that could just like be friends with anybody. Oh, absolutely. He got drawn to the music world and you could give him anything and he would go all in and trying to learn how to perfect it and be the best he could possibly be at whatever it is you give him a task in school you give him a job that he has to do oh, he was you a give hard him worker. an instrument absolutely even with gymnastics like it was all or nothing with that guy for and everything for everything and especially with like the drumming like you said and his guitar work it was just incredible i mean i mean he was ripped at 13 yeah like ripped at 13 not just like you know got some muscle on him but like genuine flagpole kind of rip you know what i mean yeah like washboard abs at a time he did that with everything and it's, it's something that you can't forget. There yeah. wasn't really, at least I don't know of any specific event that made him, I guess, have that determination and stamina and discipline with everything that he was doing. But it was very neat to talk to him and like try to understand his perspective on things because he just saw he, things different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you knew him better than I did towards the end. Why don't you tell everyone about your relationship with him? Yeah, so I met him freshman year of high school is when I actually met him. We had an English class together, so we ended up gravitating towards each other because we were both big stoners at the time. So yeah. it, was, it was pretty easy to gravitate towards each other in that sense. We didn't hang out much outside of school at this point, but we gravitated towards each other every day just because when it came down to it, we're both socially awkward. As friendly as he is, you know, he still, especially at the time, gravitated more towards a smaller crowd. He could make friends with absolutely anyone, but he did pick his favorites, and he stuck by those favorites. We weren't too close at this time, though. It wasn't until, I think, junior year of high school when I uh, came back from Utah because I moved for reasons, but came back and he was one of the few guys, you know, including yourself, that was there. But he was there, like, every day. He saw that I was low on friends, low on life, and he understood that, so he stuck by my side. And we hung out pretty much all the time at this point, sneaking out to smoke weed. But, yeah, we got really close our junior year of high school, and then we ended up working out a couple jobs together after high school. I remember he worked at Pet Club with me for a little while because he needed a job and then they went under. So that was fun. We all had to find new jobs. But yeah, we were just getting closer and closer every day at this point. We were becoming brothers. We were definitely brothers by the time we graduated. And then towards the end, he was going through some rough patch with his family and he needed a place to stay and he didn't have anywhere else to go. So me and my mother let him sleep on the couch for a while and ended up getting a room. We 
didn't want him sleeping outside or anything like that because that was his other option pretty much to tent it up somewhere so he moved in with us and it was going to be temporary it was temporary but it was going to be like maybe a few weeks until he could get a job get a new car all this stuff actually no he had the car at the time he wrecked the car when he lived with me he hydroplaned at some point it wasn't his fault but totaled the car and that's what made it not so temporary because he now needed to find a new job that was close by and get a new car so it ended up being a few weeks turned out to be like nine months or something like that and at this point you know living with the dude we became closer than anything you know I saw him every day I was checking in on him every day we'd make food for each other me and my ex at the time you know we were all very tight-knit and me and him were never closer and then he ended up getting a job with me or actually he got a job down the street saved up enough to get a car got a job with me because it was a better opportunity and then eventually saved up for his own place and he was doing okay but he was great at hiding things none of us really knew what was going on I don't want to go too much into specifics I don't think it's necessary but all this being said check in on your friends because you never know what's going on inside their heads a lot of them will hide it better than you'd ever expect we have experience with that and I'm sure a lot of you people out there do too just check in on them yeah everything you're saying is right and valid yeah and you know it's just a matter of recognizing what we have experienced Mm -hmm. with the people that we love and not taking it for granted absolutely and i mean a big reason his name does come up right now is well not only because he's a phenomenal friend of ours but he did influence my music taste Mm -hmm. a lot i mean big reason we became friends actually tight friends i remember walking into the band room one day and he was shredding some avenged sevenfold on the guitar and i walked over i'm like dude is this nightmare or whatever song he was playing he's like hell yeah it is you know them i'm like dude they're one of my favorites and music was a big driving factor for that friendship when did he not have a guitar in his hand or like a drum pad big reason his name comes up is because of the influence that he had on me when it comes to music and when he passed i don't know i for a time i was playing a lot more music because i personally felt guilty that i wasn't pursuing it the way he had because it was inspirational how he would do everything all or nothing and music was one of the alls absolutely may he rest in peace Hey, rest in peace, Brax. Love you, bro. Love you, too. I love you, bro. <laughs> yeah, I love you, too, Alex. Yeah, we all love each other. On that point, yeah. you know, I know that you've talked a lot about everything that you've learned and experienced with heavy metal and just, like, the people that have been a part of that. Is there anything else that you would like to say to the world that you think is important for all of them to know? Uh, I mean, nothing that hasn't been said already. Kind of just touch on the point, you know, check in on your friends. Like, really, that's kind of it. If you care about someone, talk to them. Nothing but love. Good intentions. We all make mistakes. Own up to them if you do. Don't just brush it under the rug and pretend like nothing happened. That's not going to solve shit. Talk it through, or at least find some sort of resolution within yourself so it doesn't become a problem. Friendship is a big one, so just check in on the ones that you care about. Thanks, Colin. I think everyone can take that in and relate it to whatever relationships that they have that are important to them. Yeah. So do what you will. Yeah. Again, you know, I appreciate you coming on and appreciate uh, you having me. To all the listeners out there, I wish you happiness and good health, and I'll see you next episode. Say, see you later, Colin. See you later, Colin. (laughs) Bye, guys.